Hey, here we are. Okay, so now you have your own personal lecture. Welcome to term three, like I said. Um, we're using the MedSurge textbook, Understanding Adult Medical Surgical Nursing, and I'm going to give you a synopsis of the chapters that we're covering. So we're going to start with chapter one. Chapter one is all about the nursing process um, and what the nursing process means. I'll put a cheat sheet up about that as well. When you think of the nursing process, you should think of the acronym ADPI. What that means is A is for assessment, D is for diagnosis, nursing diagnosis, P means plan, what's your plan, I means either intervention or implementation, so what are you going to do, and then E stands for evaluate. So the minute that you get report on a patient, you are getting information that you will use to determine what the patient's at risk for or what's actually wrong with the patient. These things help you come up with a nursing diagnosis that you would pull from that NANDA list. I will also put the new one up on Teams. And then you say to yourself, all right, well, what can I do to prevent something bad or untoward from happening to my patient? Or if something already has happened, what can I do that are independent nursing actions that can repair the issue? So I'll give you an example. Uh, I'm getting report on a patient and the patient is a post-op patient. Doesn't even matter what the surgery was. The minute that I know the patient has had surgery, I know that they have had a compromise in their skin integrity. We've done something invasive, right? So that automatically tells me that the patient is going to be at risk for infection. So when I assess the patient, I assess their incision and I say, okay, the nursing diagnosis, risk for infection. Well, now that's my A, that's my D. P, what's my plan? So what can I do to prevent that patient from developing an infection? There are lots of things I can do. I can assess the wound on a regular basis to ensure that there are no early signs and symptoms of infection looking for drainage. That's um, exudate, purulent exudate. Get used to using these words too, because you have to be able to speak like a nurse. Purulent exudate is a nice word for pus, right? So if I look at the wound and I see that there's drainage coming from it that's thick and that has like a yellow color or a green color to it and maybe has a foul odor, that's purulent exudate and that is a screaming sign of infection. So intervention, Assess that wound, say, every two hours for the first eight hours. So that's my, my, my plan, my P. And the rationale is that's a sign and symptom of infection that would give me an early intervention. So assessment, diagnosis, plan, intervention, and then what do I do? At the end of my shift, I evaluate. So my goal is going to be the patient does not develop an infection within the next, say, 12 hours, because your goal has to be measurable. And so my assessment is they have an open wound. My diagnosis is the patient's at risk for infection. My plan is I'm going to assess the wound every two hours for the next 12 hours for signs and symptoms of infection, such as purulent exudate. Um, and the rationale is that would allow me to quickly identify an infection and intervene. And I'm going to have a goal of no infection for the next 12 hours. And at the end of 12 hours, I evaluate, did the patient get an infection or did they not get an infection, right? So if my plan worked, beautiful. If my plan didn't work, then I need to reassess and then develop a new plan. And PS, that's a care plan, right? I mean, that's, that is, I just gave you a care plan and that's all of nursing, right? Everything that you do in nursing is care planning. And you even do that stuff in real life. Think about it. If you know you have tasks to do, you say to yourself, what do I have to do? That's your assessment. The diagnosis is, well, I've got seven things that need to be done. And what do I need to do first? Prioritizing, right? What is the most critical thing? So when we talk about prioritizing, let's explain what that means. You come on shift and you get report. And the report tells you that you've got, say, six patients, and one of the patients is a insulin-dependent diabetic. 
and you're working the 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. shift. Um, another patient is a chronic COPD patient that's on oxygen. Uh, another patient is a hip. They had a hip arthroplasty done, hip repair, because they broke their hip. <clears throat> when you're getting the report in your mind, you're going through and analyzing it and saying to yourself, mm, which of these patients is the most acuity, the highest level of acuity, the most critical? In other words, who could die the quickest if I don't see them first? And I know that kind of sounds simplistic, but it really is the core of how we prioritize in nursing. So that diabetic that's on insulin and it's a day shift and they're due for insulin, I need to get to them first to make sure that their blood sugar is stable, to make sure that they get their insulin and that they get their breakfast so that they don't bottom out. That's prioritizing. It's just looking at all the tasks that you have in front of you and saying to yourself, which one is the most critical? And when we prioritize in nursing, the first thing we always use are ABCs, airway, breathing, and circulation. Because, you know, if you can't breathe, then you die. Um, but in the example I just gave, you had a COPD patient, but his condition is chronic versus the diabetic who could be more acute. So in prioritizing, the first thing that we look at is the acuity of the patient utilizing ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation. And then the next thing that we look at is, is it a chronic thing that they live with all the time? Or is there something acute going on that could change quickly? If none of those things apply, then the next thing we do is we look at Maslow's hierarchy. And with Maslow's hierarchy, and I put a cheat sheet up for it, it goes through and it explains um, what are the most basic needs. You'll see it's in the shape of a pyramid. So what are the patient's most basic needs? In other words, can they breathe? Is their circulation good? Do they have food and water, sustenance, right? And then it moves on to other needs, emotional needs and psychological needs and those kinds of things. So to me, nursing prioritization isn't that complicated. It's basically just saying to yourself, of these patients that I need to see, who is the most critical and who could possibly go bad the quickest? So who do I need to see first? And there is ADPI, nursing process and nursing delegation, wrapped up with a nice little bow, okay? Um, when we assess a patient, uh, the thing that we're doing is we're looking at two things, subjective information and objective information. So let's break that down. When I'm assessing a patient, I'm doing two things. I'm looking at them. I'm, I'm assessing that patient the minute that I walk into the room to see what do they look like? Are they well-nourished? Do they look malnourished or do they look obese? What does their skin look like? What does the coloring look like? Are they pale? Are they exhibiting pallor? Or do they have a good skin tone that is congruent with their ethnicity? Um, do they appear to be relaxed or do they look like they're in pain? Are they grimacing or making faces or are they just sitting there relaxed and smiling, right? So you're assessing your patient the minute that you lay eyeballs on them. Then you're gonna be asking the patient some very important questions. When you work emergency medicine, like I did for many years, you'll learn some tricks and I'll share them with you. So if a patient comes into an urgent care clinic or to an emergency room with a chief complaint, whatever that complaint may be, I have back pain, okay? One of the first questions that you're going to ask, because this can save you a lot of time is, has this ever happened before? Because if the answer to that question is yes, well, guess what? Then you follow up with the line of questioning. When did it happen? Were you diagnosed? Did you see a doctor? Or did you go to the hospital? What did they do, right? Now, if the answer to that question is no, now you have a lot of more questions to ask because where is the pain? When did it start? Was there a precipitating event? In other words, did you fall and then your back started to hurt? Or did you just wake up in the morning and suddenly have back pain? And you want to ask the patient to qualify and quantify the pain. What does that mean? So qualifying the pain is basically describing it. Is it burning, stabbing, throbbing, aching? That's qualifying it. Quantifying it is that good old standardized scale. 
and we're going to talk about a whole lot of scales that we use in nursing because it makes it easier for us to communicate within the interdisciplinary team. So in other words, if the patient's awake, alert, and oriented, I'm going to say, I want you to put a number to your pain. So on a scale of zero to 10, zero is no pain at all. 10 is the most excruciating pain that you've ever had in your life. What number would you give your current level of pain? And that is quantifying it, right? Because quantity means number. So quantifying the pain, put a number on it, rate it. What's the severity of it? Qualifying it is a description of it, okay? And then all those other questions, what makes it better? What makes it worse, right? All that information is basically subjective because you have to ask the patient, okay? When we're doing an objective assessment, this is empirical data. These are things like vital signs, right? Your heart rate is your heart rate. It doesn't matter, you know, what you say to me. Objectively, I can put a stethoscope on and I can go to your left midclavicular line and count down to the sixth intercostal space and get an apical heart rate and rhythm, right? That's objective data. So when you're documenting, you're going to be documenting subjective and objective data. Please remember one thing when it comes to pain. Even though pain is completely subjective because, you know, a patient could be just sitting there smiling and tell you my pain is a 10, you have to believe them. Pain is whatever your patient says it is, okay? End of story. It just is. And so, you know, we, we always want to make sure that we're managing pain effectively. Um, I know that there is a lot of information out there, especially in regard to the opioid epidemic that's been going on for quite some time. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, is that addiction is very complicated and multifaceted. So if somebody is a post-op patient where somebody has some kind of an injury and they're in pain, their pain needs to be managed. Statistically speaking, about less than 1% of all patients that have had actual pain issues and have been medicated for those issues wind up having addiction issues, less than 1%. So that's a really teeny tiny little number. Um, people that have addiction problems, um, there are psychological issues, emotional issues, sometimes post-traumatic issues, lots of other issues. But if you're caring for a patient and they have a physiological condition that's causing them pain. Their pain needs to be managed because uncontrolled pain will increase blood pressure and heart rate and basically put the patient at risk for other things. Okay, so these are important things to remember. So subjective, things the patient tells you. Objective, things that you can see, hear, and feel, right? So there are things that are objective, okay? Um, the next thing I want to go over is I want to go over nursing ethical values. And I've put a cheat sheet up for those as well. Um, nursing ethical values, they are the core of the, the values that all nurses are supposed to be working under. And the ones that you need to know are on that cheat sheet. And I'm going to go over them right now with you. Um, we're going to talk about the first one. Uh, and that is veracity. The word veracity, remember, many of the terms that are in medicine, almost all of them actually, come from the Latin language. And so veracity means truth. Um, I remember it by remembering this fun line, in vino veritas, in wine, there's truth. Have you ever gone out with a bunch of friends and there's that one girl that always gets a little too drunk and when she's had a few too many, she's like, I'm sorry, I slept with that girl's husband. She just spills her guts. Boom, in vino veritas, in wine there's truth. Veracity as a nursing ethical value means you must speak the truth. You do not lie to your patients ever for any reason at all. Okay, um, so that's veracity. Uh, fidelity. Fidelity, think about it. Don't people get divorced because of infidelity? Fidelity means to be faithful, right? So if you have a patient and you tell that patient, hey, I can't stay right now, but I will be back. I'll be back in, in 40 minutes. 
you best get back to the room in 40 minutes because now the patient knows that they can trust you, that you are faithful, right? So that's what fidelity is. Justice. Justice, ethical value of justice. Here's the way I remember it. There was a movie years ago with Al Pacino. Uh, and it was called And Justice for All. So the term justice basically means I treat everyone exactly the same. Okay? So example, when I worked in the hospital, oftentimes the nurse manager would come running in and say, oh, everybody, the CEO's mother-in-law is getting admitted today. And my response would be, so? The reason for that is everybody gets treated the same with me. Everyone gets treated exactly the same. It doesn't matter. Rich, poor, you know, what color, ethnicity, religion, it doesn't matter. I'm not a cop. I'm not a judge. I'm not a jury. I'm a nurse. I am here to take care of you. I'm not here to judge you. And everybody gets treated the same. Another good example, and this is an ATI question, um, is you are the nurse in a rural clinic and you have just gotten a donation of glucometers from a big pharmaceutical company and they've given you, say, 30 glucometers. Well, you have about 150 patients that are diabetic. Who gets those glucometers? You only have 30, so you don't have enough to give one to everybody. What do you do? Do you do it based on need? And do you got, you know, that you and the other nurses get together and say, well, he's the poorest or he needs it the most. You can't do that because that actually defies justice. Because now what you're doing is you're sitting and judging who you think should get those glucometers. You can't do that. The right thing to do would be something that is absolutely objective, like say a lottery. You take all 150 patients, write their names on a piece of paper, put them in a hat, shake it up. And then you start drawing names. It's the luck of the draw. And the first 30 names that you get pulled out, they're the ones that get those 30 glucometers for free. That's justice and justice for all. Everybody gets treated the same. Uh, the next one is sometimes a little difficult for people. It is utilitarianism. Utilitarianism, the way to remember it is the end justifies the means. I don't know if you've ever heard that expression before, but what it means is it doesn't matter how I get my patients, all of them to a good outcome. It, this is the greater good. Maybe I do it in a way that's a little bit shady or I do it in a way that's a little unconventional. But the bottom line is, did everybody benefit? Did all my patients benefit with good outcomes? That's utilitarianism. Doesn't matter how I got there. The end justified the means. So my patients, the greater good, and everybody had a good outcome, that's utilitarianism. Um, the next two also get a little hairy for people, beneficence and non-maleficence. Beneficence, think about it as an active thing, okay? It means do good. So if I'm walking down the street and someone is on the ground, I'm gonna stop check that patient out or that person out, maybe give them CPR, right? That's an active thing. I'm doing good. You must always do good. That's beneficence. Non-maleficence means do no harm. So in other words, it could be something that's a non-action. Your patient tells you, listen, I want you to give me a bath in ice cubes four times a day. What? You know that that could hurt them right? That's not, that's not a good idea. So you don't give them a bath in ice cubes four times a day. You're not doing something. And by not doing it, you're doing no harm. So hopefully that makes sense and, and makes the explanation a little clearer. Um, nursing ethics are critically important. You need to know them and know what they mean and be able to apply them. Um, the Board of Nursing will ask you about them. They're on the contradictor. I'm going to ask you about them. So, you know, when I talk about something in a lecture, uh, you can better believe that it's going to be on the test. So this is the first part. I'm going to do another lecture in a minute. I'll take a break and upload this. So for your viewing pleasure. Um, and again, when you watch this, if you have any questions, something that you don't understand, 
jot down some notes, and when we get back on the Skype call in a little while, we'll go over it, okay? All right, peace out.